I think that this this kind of leads on to um, a problem I see a lot in a lot of businesses, and and certainly I think in the independent space and the startup space is that businesses start out, like I said, because they've got a network that they can sell to, and that they've probably already talked to about the idea and they're all warm to it. The problem comes when that network initial network dries up and you haven't done the legwork to shore up what comes next and where you get your leads from next, and you get that moment of yep. pure panic. So. I look on, yes. I'm always a little bit sympathetic for people who drop in my inbox in that way because one, it's clear they don't know any better and two, they're just trying to pay the bills like I am. So as annoying as it is, I kind of get <laughs> where they're coming from as much as it's annoying and it just makes me want to kind of put an arm around the shoulder and go, do you know what, there are better ways of doing this and you probably should have, the best, exactly. plan, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, second exactly. best time to plant a tree is right now. Right now, um, yep. and just kind of, but it's amazing how many of those people just aren't open to trying anything different, and that's where I start to get frustrated. Is you've got to be open, you've got to be adaptable, and when you do come across somebody who wants to help you change what you're doing, just listen. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the Don't problem is is I think I think the problem is that some of them work for large, well-funded organizations that have hired an army of salespeople, and they've been given a script, and they've been told this is what you do, and they follow it. And, yeah. you know, maybe one in a hundred work, who knows? Yeah. But imagine, imagine, you know, thinking about it from a sales management perspective, imagine if you could change that one in a hundred to three in a hundred, tripling your, your, your sales potential. So, you know, yeah, okay. It might take a couple of extra weeks, but again, it's, it's that, you know, it's that thinking, thinking a little longer term and especially, you know, and, and, and I know what it's like when you start out. I, I, I know what it's like when you start out because I know what it's like when you start out because I had exactly the same thing in the wine business, you know, and I, I started reaching out to my network and all of a sudden the feedback I was getting from people was, well, hang on, you're a, you're a listed company CFO. Why are you trying to flog me wine? And, and it was just like, you know, I had to re-educate the market. And, and I think, you know, I, I look at it now when I get when I get those kind of LinkedIn connections and someone tries to sell me something, I just, I have a standard thing that I've saved in my, in my notes and I just cut and paste it in. Uh, and I just say, rather than trying to sell me, don't you want to, you know, get to know who I am and what I'm interested in? I think though that there's also, and the, the other one I sometimes, the other side of things, which is where people kind of come in and there are like, I got one the other day that was asking me um, how long I've been following Gar Gary V on LinkedIn. And I'm like, yeah. There's, there's about two and a half million people that follow Gary V, and he's very well known. The likelihood is that anybody you connect with will follow Gary V. That is a pretty loose cannon, yep. and it's clearly a, a, a first step before you then slap me with something. So, and like my, my response was, yeah. How about I show you a better way? Because I, you know, I show people how to educate their audience through video content on LinkedIn. That's that's so that's my day job, absolutely. And actually, that's a much nicer absolutely, yeah, just go, Hey. Um, you know, you will probably get value from the content I'm producing. Come and have a look at what's on my feed. If you're interested, then, you know, yeah. of course we can do business. And if not, yep. well, have a fantastic yep. week and we're probably not suited to each other. That's fine. Exactly. No, but it's interesting yeah. you say that because I'm I'm currently doing a, a series where I'm I'm reading this to camera. I mean, it's available on audio and, and on, on Audible and, and all that, but I'm just, I'm doing a, a, a read to camera and then my, my, um, my digital marketing guy and my team is then cutting that down into, you know, 30, 60 second yeah. clips. And then we'll just, we'll just drip feed them out. But yeah, it's just putting that content out to the marketplace. And that's it. You know, um, people can take your, your processes and your strategy and everything. And you, if you give that away for free, they get the value from that. But actually the ones that can put it into practice would probably put it into practice some way, shape or form themselves anyway, because they're capable and they were never your customer. Yep. yep. Um, but what they can't do with yep. that, no matter how much information you give them, is they haven't got you. And that's where the real value of consulting comes from, is that they can't replicate you, your yes. knowledge, your experience and processes. And what yep. seems a simple thing can actually be very complex in practice to try and do yourself if you've never done it before. Very. Yeah, very, very. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I always, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, that seems so expensive. And I always say, well, you know, refer back to Richard Branson, who always says, get the best advisors you can. He, I mean, early, early in his career, he got into a spot of bother with, uh, 
with the VAT man when they were they were importing records and 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 falsifying stuff, and uh, he he went out and got the best lawyers and accountants to support him in the case, and they were able to get it all through and sorted. And ever since, he's always said, "Get the best get the best professional advisors that you can. It's worth it." Yep. You know, I mean, if you think about it, let's say you're doing a deal worth ten million quid, and you hire a cheap lawyer to do the documents for you, and something goes wrong, and the deal falls apart. Versus you hire a lawyer that's going to cost you, you know, maybe 25, 30, 40 grand. But they've been doing this for 50 years. They've done 6,000 deals like it. They know exactly what the issues are. They advise you and support you and guide you. And, you know, it makes sure that the deal goes through. And, and then all of a sudden it's a 10 million pound deal. And it, it you know, it's the size of your company. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah part, of, part of the challenge is getting people to start thinking longer term. And again, that's why... I don't deal with sub two million pound businesses anymore because their mindset is in a different place. And it's not that there's anything wrong with them. It's, it's a, you know, I, 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 I applaud anyone who's starting a business, but for the stuff that I'm doing around fundraising and M and a, you can't do that with teeny tiny companies because I mean, even if you could, you know, the, the, the founders would end up being diluted down so heavily when, when any amount of, of serious money was raised. Yeah. Perfect. So I guess just before we wrap up the show, David, uh, first of all, it's been a it's been a genuine pleasure to have a chat with you, and it's been some really interesting insights shaking out. Likewise, I hope that people can kind of we get a lot of business owners that are watching the podcast, so hopefully you know there's some actionable stuff or some thoughts in there that they can start to articulate a little bit. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to that sub two million pound business to make them more likely to get to a place where you can help them? What is the one thing that you would, you would advise them to start doing today? Ooh, okay. 